Highly skilled athletes train, prepare, practice, and keep their eyes on the prize. Is that what delivers success? Or is there a healthy dose of luck needed to tie it all up with a big blue first prize bow? With us for their insights on such perennial questions, we welcome, in Orlando, Florida, Tom Sterner, former assistant coach for the Toronto Raptors and the Golden State Warriors, among others, in New York, New York, Hamilton, Ontario's own Kia Nurse, who currently plays for the New York Liberty of the Women's National Basketball Association. And here in our studio, Sherry Bradish, director of the Future of Sport Lab at Ryerson University, and Peter Jensen, mental performance coach, Olympic trainer, and author of Thriving in a 24-7 World, an energizing tale about growing through pressure. Great to have everybody on the program for a rather timely discussion, given what this city, province, and country are obsessed with right now. Key, I want to start with you. Based on your experiences, and I have a whole list here of them, uh, but if I went into them all, we wouldn't have any time left for the conversation. So let's just say you're a pretty fabulous athlete who's achieved a great deal at many different levels of sports. What are the key factors that you think go into winning a championship beyond the regular stuff that those of us who just spectate would know about? Well, I think fortunately I've been a part of a lot of great teams who are filled with awesome people, awesome players, but I think the big thing that we had was leadership. And that is something that is invaluable, something that you can't really see from cameras or just watching a game itself. It's in the locker room. It's the aspects of our teams that people don't get to see. And I think that's something that's exciting for us as players and special to have that in our locker room. But it's tough to explain to people why we're so good or why we have such great leaders without them actually being there to experience it themselves. Tom, I've seen so many different kinds of leadership. There's the, you know, quiet Lou Gehrig types. There's the rah-rah, let's get them going, Billy Martin types. Do you know what works best? Well, I think you need a combination of everything. You take a look at the Toronto Raptors right now, Kawhi Leonard is as quiet and as reserved a player as you could have on the floor, but yet his confidence is exuberated on the floor in terms of his performance and how he goes out and, and in a, in a craftsman-like way just carves up the opponent. Kyle Lowry on the other side is an emotional guy. He's a guy that's a fiery guy. He has a big voice in huddles and timeouts. He has a voice in the locker room before games. I think you need a combination of, of, of several different pieces in order to have a championship, uh, championship team. Here's um, maybe a different factor that we should add to the list, and that is, and I don't know how you plan for this, I think it just happens. The answer is luck. One of the things you need to win is luck. And can we start maybe... Raptors, 76ers, game seven, no time left on the clock. Somebody goes up for a final buzzer beater, and four bounces later, Sheldon, roll it, please. It's off the Leonard, defended by Simmons. Is this the dagger? Clearly, so far, the greatest moment in Canadian basketball history. Let's just, as well, bring up some isolated pictures of those. This one, the first one here from Post Media, Stan B. Hall. Look at that ball. That must have taken an hour and a half for that ball to go in. And then a close-up shot by Rich Madonic of the Toronto Star. There's the next one as Kawhi waits for that thing in a crouched position to go in, and eventually did. Let me share some numbers here on the unlikelihood of that happening. We have University of Toronto statistician Jeffrey Rosenthal crunched some numbers for us. He said that a total of 43 out of about 4,000 NBA playoff games are won by buzzer beaters. In other words, a shot that goes in right as the buzzer ticks. So that's about 1% of NBA games, pretty rare. He also says an NBA playoff series has a roughly 1 in 400 chance of ending in a Game 7 buzzer beater. That's a quarter of a percent. And the odds on a Game 7 buzzer beater where the ball bounces four times on the rim before going in, never mind. We didn't ask him about that one, but you know that that one is just crazy unlikely. So, going back to where we started, Kia, let me get you first. How much would you say, I get leadership, I get talent, I get skill, how much is luck a factor? I think luck gets a little bit of love here, especially in this situation. I think one of the important things to look at is when you look at Kawhi Leonard and his ability to take a clutch shot like that, 
I've noticed a bunch of times, every time he's in that situation, he goes all the way down to the corner, which is where most people don't go when they have to take that shot. And he has the footwork and he practices that shot every day. So it's that little fadeaway that goes. But to have those four bounces, that was a shooter's roll, a little bit of a shooter's touch there, but a lot of luck helped that. Peter, how about luck? I know you put a great deal of effort into making sure that the mind is in the right place, but what about luck? I'm with Stephen Leacock. He said the harder I find, the harder I work, the more luck I have. That is true. And if he didn't have the proper arc on that shot, he wouldn't have got those bounces. And he talked about how his shot had been a little flat and he got a little more arc, got a little more height on it. But yeah, it, eventually it all plays, it does play a role. There's no use saying it doesn't. I've just come from working with the hockey coaches at the Program of Excellence at Hockey Canada last week, all the men who will coach for Canada this year. And you know, you can do everything you want, but with a round puck and, and ice and a goalie and a referee, things happen. Hmm. Things happen all the time. Cherry, how about it? Uh, I come from a little bit of a perspective where it's an art and a science, and so there's some intangibles like luck, but I also think in this case and from the space we're looking at at Ryerson, uh, looking at strategically what were all those really unique elements that went into the composition of the team and the front bench and the front office uh, that is happening today. And so from that perspective, you have those intangibles such as luck in that shot, but I think there was a lot of steps, and I think you'll probably get into it, but looking at their sports science director, Alex McKechnie, and mm -hmm. he describes it, or it's been described, he's a maestro of the team in terms of understanding the players, both as the science first and then building that trust in, and looking at the art of performance and, and, and getting to the places that we see them tonight. Tom, I wonder as a coach, as somebody who spends hour after hour after hour doing the preparation and making sure the guys are healthy and making sure the guys are well practiced and making sure you know the list of things you've got to go through and an entire season can come down to whether the ball bounces off the rim four times and in or out. How aggravating is that for you knowing what a role luck plays in all of this? Well, it, it can be frustrating, but one of the things that you do as a coach is you just try to put your team in the best position to win. At the end of the day, as you saw throughout this series, there's times when the Raptors didn't shoot the ball well. But what you have to do is you have to put your emphasis on things that you can control. How hard you play, uh, what quality of defense do you have, uh, what things can you do to affect the outcome of the day, game that just doesn't revolve solely around shooting. I'm sure Kia will, will, can talk a lot about her, her success at, at UConn in terms of how well they play defensively. So one of the things that you do is you take that chance of luck out by outworking people. And in talking to Nick Nurse the other day, I complimented him on the fact that I saw in this series, in, in the Milwaukee series, in the Philadelphia series, a team play harder for 48 minutes for the entire time than I have in a long time. And I think that's why they're, they're being successful right now. Hmm. Kia, can I go through a bit of a checklist with you? Who's Darnell? Yeah. <laughs> Darnell's my brother. He's in the NHL. <laughs> Who does he play for? Edmonton Oilers. Who's Richard? Richard is my father. He played in the CFL for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Greatest team in the world. Yes, I know. Uh, who, who is, uh, who's Donovan McNabb? Donovan McNabb is my Pro Bowl uncle, quarterback for the NFL, Eagles, Vikings, Redskins. He was there for about 13 years. Took him to the Super Bowl one year, the Eagles. I remember that well. Um, yeah. How about Raptors coach Nick Nurse? No, wait, he's not related. Never mind. He's Let, not related. We just have the same name. <laughs> <laughs> let's take him off the list. My point is, uh, you obviously come from a family uh, with a lot of tremendous athletic excellence. So I want you, if you would, to compare, because I know you've played a number of sports as well, compare what it takes to winning a basketball game, five people on the court, to winning a hockey game, six players on the ice, to winning a football game, CFL 12, NFL 11 people on the field at the same time. What's the difference? I think one of the big things is basketball, a lot of times what I hear from a young age was basketball's a game of runs. So it's about how many runs can your team make, who has the longest run in terms of the scoring. So if you go on a team like Golden State who usually has a really, really good third quarter, no matter if they're down at halftime, they usually come out and go on a huge scoring run which puts them in a position to win the game. Those teams that go on long runs that are able to get defensive stops, those teams are able to be successful in this league. And that's why the Raptors so far have been so successful because they've been able to put together defensive stops and turn those into offense. So I think for me, being able to play a sport like basketball, why it's so difficult to win is because I can make one mistake and I can go back and get it on the other end. Where in hockey, I can make a mistake that leads to a goal, but 
I can't go right down the next play and make a make it up for it by scoring a goal. That's mm -hmm. where it gets difficult. So I think trying to score that those many points, but also come defensively stops and make those adjustments as soon as they are. In football, you get to stop every possession and say, okay, here's our strategy for the next play. In basketball, it's on the fly. It's moving, it's going. You don't get a ton of stoppages to play. So how do you adjust to win a basketball game as it's going that quickly? Gotcha. Peter, talk to us about some of the intangibles that, that determine whether you're successful or not. For example, the Golden State Warriors right now are dealing with some, you know, very, very serious injuries to some very key personnel. That's a break for the Raptors, but it's nothing they could have planned for or counted on, right? No, and you wouldn't want to count on that uh, if you're the Raptors. Obviously, as, as Coach said, you're going to focus on the things that you're going to do and the things you need to do. And, you know, to add to Kia's point, you know, basketball is about trying to do the right things and football is about trying to do it right. And that's, that's very, very different. You know, basketball requires a high IQ of the players. The players have to really think on the floor. And as a coach, Tom has to push the skills down to the players because the players make all the decisions in that game. And in basketball, one player can make a huge difference. Not so much so in hockey or in football. Yeah, Tom, I mean, we see this all the time where a coach will call a play on the sidelines, but then once the ball's inbounded, uh, how much influence are you really having over what's going on on the floor? Well, per hopefully if your execution is good, if you set a good screen, say, on a pick and roll, um, or, and you come off, you've practiced uh, the outcome of that uh, in, in a sense that you read your options. Does the defender step up and, and switch? Does he, does he try to show? Does he try to go under? And, and by making the reads and practicing those reads over and over again, you, you're almost on automatic in terms of where you're looking. Spot-ups now in the NBA in terms of where p players are positioned are stationary with the idea that as, if I'm a ball hander and I'm going to come off on a play, I can not even look at where I'm throwing the ball. I kind of know where I'm going. All I have to do is read the defensive, uh, the defender on the play, and that dictates where I'm going to go in terms of how I'm going to perform on the play. But that's things you practice a lot and, and rep it. You watch it on film, and, and the analytics that goes into it will help you determine exactly what you need to do. Let me follow up on that word with Sherry, because that's the word we hear all the time now, Sherry, analytics. What role did the Raptors have in the advancement of our understanding of baseball analytics over, let's say, the last five, six, seven years? Basketball. Basketball. Um, the Raptors were really um, instrumental. I mean, this analytics movement, even though we feel like it's common practice in sport, and there's been great advancements through MIT and the Sloan Sport Analytics Conference, et cetera, but really only the last five years, whether we're talking the business or in this case the, the team side of sport operations, really has, have we seen analytics and technology take off and emerge and be embraced in the way it has so broadly today. And the Raptors in about 2013, and Grant Land wrote an excellent piece on it, if anyone wants to reference it. a sports website. Right. Uh, came and spent some time with the Raptors. I think that those days are a little bit over in terms of opening up our books. Here's what we're doing. Uh, the approach to the openness of the data is a little different because of the competitive nature. But the Raptors in particular embraced a technology called SportView, which was at that time really just um, in a handful of uh, NBA teams did this. They implemented this technology in the venues where they tracked every shot, uh, both of their team and of their opponents. So they could look at offensively and defensively where and how are shots being made. And I think if you look at, and a lot of the work, was, the groundbreaking work was done really by geography majors and, and um, Kirk Goldsbury and some of those people really mm -hmm. early on to break down the, the maps that way. And you really see, if you look over time, the Raptors were influential in embracing it and talking about it so broadly. And obviously that technology has gotten completely sophisticated today in a, in a much more deeper way. But they really were one of the pioneers in embracing this technology and so openly talking about, let's put it in the arenas and use it from a number of, of techniques. The conventional wisdom, of course, is that baseball is the sport that loves analytics the most. And there are a million different statistics right. and things you can measure in baseball, um, which leads me to believe that that's probably true. What would you say the difference is in terms of the influence of analytics on baseball versus hockey versus football versus basketball? So I think we all know it's a conversation that we see in this country. Um, hockey is considered a, a, a late adopter in that space. We know when Kyle was hot, Dubas was hired by the Toronto Maple Leafs, that conversation in this country in NHL about analytics and data had never happened in that way. Again, he's the 30-something general manager of the Leafs who was brought in to be the 
you know, that's right. the smarty pants guy. So yeah. that conversation had never happened in that way, in this mm -hmm. country in particular. Um, where I see it different in basketball is the adoption of it in the way that players are not drafted and the way the players are not played and how even when we talk about quiet, I'm sure that will come up in terms of load management and those pieces. Mm -hmm. The more numbers you can understand and attach to your player, then the better decisions you can make from a science perspective about how, how, you, how you draft them, how you want to trade them, and then how you want to play them. Peter, how much do analytics play into the work that you try to do, which is very much focused on the brains? Well, it, it plays in a lot because what you're asking the players to do is make changes. <laughs> and anytime you ask a player to make a change, you're going to get resistance of some form. And, and learning to be more aware and, and doing small little things. Um, I, you know, I worked with Kia for three years when she was on the women's national team at the Olympics in Rio and things. So, for example, our analytics told us that we were shooting 51% from the foul line at the World Championships. And so I spent some time the next practice teaching them a breathing technique to use at the foul line, just as an example. Hmm. Just as an example of a skill set that allows the analytics to you know, supplements. And we should compliments. tell people 51% from the foul line well, it's stinks. Not good. No, it's but not we good. We never at all. shot below 81% yeah. after that point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So it did have a positive impact. Tom, can you tell me about when you take, for example, um, information to players that comes as a result of your analytics department crunching numbers? How open are they to using that information to change the way they've done things maybe since they were kids? Well, one of the things you try to do as a coach is your credibility is, is the most important part. And if I can illustrate to them mathematically in some ways, but more importantly on video, and show them exactly where instances are on game film or during the course of, of their background, that I can make an improvement, all of a sudden in their minds, they're, they're, they're wide open. They want to learn because obviously the better they perform, the more they get paid. And, and at the end of the day, I think that's a driving line for a lot of professional athletes is obviously they want to win championships and that's number one and paramount, but they're also trying to provide for a family as well. So through that and through the fact that you can train them to be better players, they're all ears. They want to learn. Kia, can you give me an example of where a coach or an analytics advisor came to you with some information that you didn't know about the way you play the game that was helpful and therefore you used it going forward. Yeah, in Connecticut, when I first got there, I was really known as a driver. I was someone who could get to the basket at will, but my three-point shot was something that people decided they were going to give me and allow me to try and make in front of them. So when I was there, Coach Ariyama and Coach Ralph, they made sure that I had to change my shot a little bit. And I was a little reluctant to do it because I was very used to the way that I shot the ball, and I figured if I needed it, it would go in. But they really only moved my hand over the slightest bit, changed my shoulder and changed one of my feet to go a little bit in front of the other. And from that point on, I became one of the most lethal shooters that we had in the, the country at the time. So hmm. it's always kind of interesting because you don't, you, you know, you want to be the way you are. And you're saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But it's a little broke. <laughs> we got to fix it a little bit so that you can be more consistent. And now people play me for my three-point shot more than they play me for my drive. So it was a good change to have to make. Interesting. Let me follow up on that with Tom because w when I was watching basketball as a kid, the whole idea was to get the ball inside into the paint and get, you know, as close to the hoop as possible to get your shot in. Nowadays, of course, there's been a massive change in the game, maybe over the last five, six, seven years, where the number of players trying to take those three-point shots from outside the arc uh, that Kia just referred to has really gone up exponentially, and apparently analytics gets the credit for this. Here's how one former nba -er feels about the influence of analytics on the game. David West, retired last year from the NBA after helping lead the Warriors to two titles, said, stop letting nerds tell you how to play basketball. What's your reaction to that? Well, first of all, one of the things you take a look at, and I'll give you the top five, it's a dunk, it's a free throw, it's a corner three in the NBA, arc threes, and anything inside the arc is just not a very good shot. The Toronto Raptors in the last game took eight shots uh, inside the arc, primarily from a guy by the name of Kawhi Leonard. When they had DeMar DeRozan on the team, DeMar was also a very effective two-point shooter. But what made DeMar an efficient shooter was the fact of how many times he went from the free throw line. I understand what Mr. West is saying. You know, I understand what he's saying in terms of playing your game. But a lot of times the game has, has changed. When, when David West was playing in the game, we had power forwards. We had Shaquille O'Neal, Alonzo Mourning, Patrick Ewing. We had those type of players, that talent pool in the league. Today we don't. 
Kevin Durant being a seven-footer who by uh, standards 15 years ago would have been put on the low block and told he had to be able to post up now, is on the perimeter and has the guard skills of some of the best pit players in our league. So the league has changed, the rules have changed, all those things have, have dictated how we go and play a game now in the NBA. And uh, I, I think it's evolving. And so with that, if you don't evolve and you don't change with it, you're going to be left behind. Hmm. Peter, can I do a follow-up on that issue you just brought up a second ago, teaching some breathing techniques yeah. to players on the foul line so yeah. that they can really focus, be in the moment, and get those shots in? How does that work in as much as you've got 18,000 fans screaming at you potentially, you've got all those people in the end zone seats who are waving those things to distract you. Are you telling us that just learning how to breathe properly can overcome all of those external forces? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and because of, of the way it works, you see, if you're an emergency care worker and you, you arrive on the scene of a horrendous accident, what keeps you focused? Airways, breathing, circulation. Hmm. Well, you know, I take that same acronym and I use it in sport. Become aware, breathe, and then choose where you want to pay attention. Now, the difference is the minute you focus on your breath, all that other stuff falls away. The fact that it's the fourth quarter, your mind is telling you you've got to make this shot, all of that stuff disappears because you can only pay attention to one thing at a time. So if you truly focus on the breath, even one or two breaths, that's all, then you move to a place where you have choice. Hmm. You know, you put in the pause, and, and instead of reacting, you respond. Uh, Viktor Frankl talked a lot about that, didn't he? The pause between yeah. the initial and, 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 and our action. And that's active awareness, but becoming aware, becoming mindful. And of course, Kawhi Leonard is a master of it. He's a master of it for sure, but Kia, you're the only one on this program tonight who probably has been in that set of circumstances where the clock is running down, you've got the ball, everybody in the place knows that you're expected to take the shot that's either going to win the game or lose the game. What's going through your head as the clock ticks down and you've got to make that shot? It depends on the day, um, but I would say, obviously, I, I have worked with Peter before, so the breathing technique is something that's easy to use. I think there's a lot that goes on around you. So you hear all the noises in your own head. You're thinking, I got to make this so that my team wins. I don't want to let people down. But I think as you get older and the more you become part of the game, it learns to be more confident in yourself. Every time I get to the free throw line now, I'm thinking, this is a free point. Like, this is the easiest thing I can do the entire game. There's no one in front of me, and I've made this a million times in the gym by myself, so I can make it here. So I think people like Kawhi Leonard, people who are closers in this game that we have nowadays, they look at it like, this is a layup. And that's essentially what it is in the NBA. People who miss free throws in the NBA, I'm always kind of dumbfounded by because it is, it's a layup for everybody. And I think that's something that allows them to be as clutch as they are, as calm and as cool and collected as they are because they are able to kind of keep their focus in one place, like Peter said, and that allows you to be successful in your own way. What's your free throw shooting percentage right now? 91. 91. Okay, not I've Rick missed, Barry, but pretty good. Two. I've missed two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's outstanding. Sherry, tell us about how tech, how does technology help the mindset of an athlete when they need it most? So we can see that manifested in a few different ways. What we're working with at Ryerson is in the startup ecosystem. So mm -hmm. I tend to speak to it from some of the technologies that we see that we're working with and some of the, the companies. Um, as Peter said, there's, there's some specific uh, applications and apps that athletes are now using and adopting in this country. Uh, we have some great um, stories in terms of a company like Conduct or a company like Push who are working with athletes and trainers and their respective teams and the, the team side to really help them understand from both a training and in-game in performance perspective, mm -hmm. understand their percentages and understand how they can take those shots better and understand. So really the whole athlete now is sport is all in and adopting technology both on the player and on the business side. Tom, I'm curious about, um, you know, I, har I hearken back to the baseball player Yogi Berra who used to say 90% of this game is half mental. Yogi wasn't big on math, but we knew what he meant. Uh, essentially, don't think too much and don't let your head uh, ruin your opportunity to make a great play. How, how do you teach players who are the best in the world at what they do not to get too much inside their heads so they don't miss the big moment? Well, I think, I think you, in talking about free throw shooting, I thought it was interesting you talked about the breathing and the pause. We, we try to have every player have a routine. 
you walk to the foul line, you put your foot at the same spot, you, you take the same number of dribbles. That breath may come somewhere in there wherever you feel comfortable. But I agree, I agree a lot with what Peter's saying in terms of staying in the moment. I know in timeouts, a lot of times we'll talk to players about stay in the moment. Focus in on the things we control. We're not talking about making shots. We're not talking about this is the shot we need. We're talking about get the best available shot that you can. And because of that, I think it puts players' mind at ease. You may run a play, and Kawhi Leonard may be responsible for making the play. He doesn't necessarily have to shoot it all the time. He has to make the right play. And you've got to trust, and again, through practice and repetition, that you're going to come out with a positive outcome. Uh, analytics can only take you so far. I said, it's interesting because I actually brought one of my old playoff books with me just to remind myself a little bit uh, that, of what we developed in Toronto in terms of being able to uh, be able to, get, to make the game easier for the players. You're not going to give them this entire book of information. You're going to give them the pieces and the things they need to know for that individual matchup and for that individual play. Peter, do players think too much and can that get in the way of their success? Oh, thinking too much and anything can get in the way of your success. I mean, you want to be unconsciously competent, which is why you take your, your athletes through so many drills. You know, you talk beautifully about the pick and roll. You do it so many times. And you simulate. Uh, in the women's team, we used to simulate. At the end of the game, we used to do a, a, at the end of the practice, rather, we do a thing called shoot for cash. And, uh, and, and it's a shot from center, center court. <laughs> and I would actually tape money on the floor. And, and the players could... And then, and then I put in a qualifying round, which Kia didn't like at all, uh, where you had, to go, like yeah, where the, you had to go shoot foul shots in order to qualify to shoot for the cash, you see. But it's just to simulate and put a little pressure on it just, just to have fun, right? Mm. But at the same time, they're, they're learning and adapting skill set, right? Kia, one of the interesting things I've learned about NBA players is that not every one of them, even though they're the best in the world, not everyone wants the ball in his or her hands with time counting down and one shot left to win the game. What's the difference between the player who wants to take that shot and the player who doesn't want to be anywhere near the ball when that shot goes down? Well, part of it is the role that you play on the team. And I think you could look at every single team in the NBA, and if you're watching a game, you knew exactly who wants to take the shot at the last second, and you know exactly which team wants that person to take it. I mean, I play on a team that has a ton of incredible players, but we know at the end of the day, Tina Charles is probably going to take that last shot because we know her percentages, her confidence, her ability to do it is what we put our trust in. And I think that's something that you have to really learn and gain that trust and that confidence from your teammates in practice. It starts the moment that you get into your training camps or the moment that you get into workouts with your teammates. That's when you start to kind of pick out who wants that moment and who doesn't. And I think part of it is a little bit innate if you're just growing up as a competitor who really wants to get that done. And then part of it is you can learn it. If you go into every game with the confidence that you want, every game knowing that the person in front of you is going to make plays, they're going to make shots, going to make tough defensive plays, but I can counter it and I can do something for it, I'll take that shot. And I love a leader who will come up to me and say, give me the ball at the end of the shot clock, we'll be all right. Hmm. Tom, I want to talk about chemistry. I've seen New York Yankees teams in the late 1970s where all the players hated each other, they hated Reggie Jackson, they hated their manager, and they won, and they won, and they won. I've also seen teams like the Argonauts of 15 years ago where the players loved each other so much, I remember doing post-game interviews on the field, and one player broke down and cried because he loved his players so much, his teammates, and was so happy that they were all going to share this. In your view, what's a better team chemistry? Well, I think it depends. Uh, first of all, if you make the number one priority that you have in a team about winning, then you're all going to make the right decisions. You may not like each other. I've, I've been... 27 years in the NBA, and I've seen a little bit of everything from, from chemistry teams. Uh, Pat Williams, who was the general manager for the Orlando Magic for the longest time, talked about how hard it was to achieve that. Uh, you try to do things to cultivate that. You try to position players in a locker room where they sit uh, just because you want them to interact. If there are two players that didn't necessarily interact well, you're still going to put them together because ultimately you want to break down the barriers that can cause you not to be successful. There are things that you can do to try to control that. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter whether you like each other or you're not, as long as, as winning is your ultimate goal. Now, as we sit here taping this in our last minute and a half, we don't know the outcome of Game 5. So yeah. tell me, if the Raptors win it all, why will they have won it all? Uh, me? I'll yeah, go. Yeah, I, go, Tom. I, I, 
I, I think because they're playing harder. I think they're absolutely playing harder. The pace of the play, the fact that they're getting back transitionally in defense and taking away the strength of the Golden State Warriors, and at the end of the day, they're playing harder at the defensive end. Those three things are the key elements to why the Toronto Raptors will be world champions in 2019. Kia, how about you? I would say playing hard is a huge part of it as well, but they are playing together. You know, they're a team that is not full of a million superstar names like the Golden State Warriors, but they make what they do well, each and every one of them, so they play to their strengths and they play together, and I think that's something that's special about them as well. Peter? Oh, I think they're playing in the moment. They're not getting ahead of themselves. You know, they're just, they're doing what they need to do. They're all, Kyle and Kawhi are so calm, aren't they? They're, they're just so calm. It, and they don't celebrate too much when they contagious. win. And it's contagious. Yeah. Yeah. Cherry, you get the last word. I think it's a combination of all the things all the guests have spoken about as well. I think <laughs> uh, it's a yeah, perfect moment, and I think uh, I think we feel it if we're in the street, that there's also that intangible lift that this city and this country is giving them that we can factor into another show. We are all excitedly anticipating the explosion to come. Uh, let's hope it's all wonderful. Kia Nurse, Tom Sterner, Peter Jensen, Cherry Brandish, so, Bradish, excuse me, good of all of you to come on TVO tonight, and thanks for your help on this great topic. All right, thanks. thanks. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.